this area, I think it was for uh, for black people. They moved here, you know, long ago. Can't really tell you that much because I haven't taken Canadian history yet, but I just know that it's a black community. Uh, I do know it was uh, primarily a black community, probably a hundred years ago, I'm not exactly sure. That was our land. Our land went from the Armdale Rotary all the way down to that, that street, which was called Beach Hill. And it's not anymore. Beachville, which was formerly Beach Hill, is now less than, if you blink, you've driven past it and you've gone into Lakeside and Timberlake. In actual fact, uh, there was Lakeside when I was growing up, but I remember my mother and them saying there was no such thing as Lakeside when they were growing up. That was all part of the land that was handed over to the slaves, which has been now taken back from the slaves, if you will. That's our history. That's the history of Beachville. It's getting to the point that all we have now is the Monroe subdivision and even the church property, the little that they say that we own of it. Um, it's a sad thing. My mother and father are over here. So my dad was left alone and he never married or anything, but uh, he was the deacon of the church. They called him the mayor of Beachville. Beachville way I remember growing up. Let me see. I remember it being taught, spoken to the church. I remember Dr. Oliver talking about it. These men that were coming and encouraging you to sell their property, don't sell. The houses was fairly close together. And with that, Dr. Oliver and Dad worked together to get the Monroe subdivision. There was no phone, no running water. Because there were people that uh, were living in um, unsanitary homes. I live there now, but they all were able to have a cooperative housing. These men. It was great. These men, you see the little house on the prairie, you know how they're building houses, and this one has a carpenter, this one's a plumber. Well, that's what they did up in the subdivision. There's, some people were plumbers, some people were roofers, some were drywall, whatever they call them, you know, the mud men. They built their own homes, and the homes were up there. And hey, that's, that's historical. That's historical in itself. We have a lot of uh, white people in the subdivision now. When it was first built, it was all blacks, but some of the people lost their homes and bought up by white people, you know, so I guess what they say is you can't fight progress. You can't. Um, if you look around in our Beachville estates, in our community of Beachville now, the faces have changed. In, instead of being the black as being the my, majority, we're a minority right now. Yeah, I remember when we moved in here, there was, the, it ended around it ended before that pole, and everything behind here was rocks and trees and bushes and stuff, and now it's all roads. There's barely any any trees left. For change, I guess that's in, you know, and for the schools, it, it, there's not a whole lot of our, our children. I want to know you as a person of Lord and Savior, that Heavenly Father, the Son of your word, Heavenly Father, would so go forth and not return unto you. For the blessings that we're about to receive, in Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen. 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 When this all happened in Africville in 62, now, I was younger, but I remember my father having meetings at the church, uh, at home with, um, with um, white men, I should say. You know, I don't know who they were. I was maybe 8, 9, 10. But I remember him having meetings in our house, and, and there was another other gentleman that Dad knew that was going to Kamala Street. And Dad went up the road, Okay, this man came with, with uh, I don't think he had money, but he had hopes for the people that lived up further from the community. And they were going to sell the property, and, and that, at that time, in the 60s, okay, 68, I don't know what year it was. But I remember Dad uh, talking to these people, talking to the members of the community that lived up the road, and he said, don't sell your property. Stay here. I know the money looks good, but don't sell your property. And he talked to a lot of them. Most of them moved into the city. Okay, some of them moved into the city and got an apartment. They lost that property. And I drive by there now, so I have to drive by to go to my, my home in the Monroe subdivision. But I drive by there and I think there was a Cousin Annie's hose, Mr. This one and this one. Nobody. They're all, it's commercial land now. 
It's commercial land. It was sold. You know, they came in and they, you know, tried to squeeze Beachville out because it's a black community and they think that people are basically not intelligent enough. But they, they've got to remember this is a new generation and you don't get away with the same things as you got away with before. Most of the land around here now doesn't belong to um, the, the people of uh, the original settlers. Just came in and, you know, some, you know, build up and, you know, industrial took over and stuff like that. If we had a fight with the industrial park, they moved in and they named their park Lakeside Industrial Park, which is right in the middle of Beachville. I think it's been, uh, you know, bought by the, the developers and uh, they start building it and it's very, very uh, nice things really to do, you know, because this area, it's a very, very good location. It's close to uh, one of the most popular uh, business park here in, in, in Nova Scotia, Bears Lake, you know. There was a time where this land was worth nothing, where indeed it was said that Beachville was only built on a rock and that it was, it was poor land it's when it was owned by blacks. But now that we don't own the land, now suddenly it's prime land. This is the best place to live. Is it sad? Yeah, it, it, it can be. We used to have uh, uh, church picnics, and every family was involved with, you know, setting up, doing stuff. Um, we had CJT groups. We had. I remember going to church three times on Sunday. We'd go to church, and after church, we'd come up and we'd sit on that white railing and we'd just sing. But we had to be in the house by nine o'clock, so we made the best of our time. <laughs> Yeah, I still remember those days. Uh, wherever Dr. Oliver was, Dad was. This church that's here now, uh, Dad helped build. Uh, my father and Dr. Oliver and the other deacons we got together and they decided that we would build a new church. When this church was built in 1979, members of the community helped out. Our forefathers built the church, so people in the community had a place of refuge, where to go. Church to me is I love church, I always tell you. I, I feel really A1 when I'm in church. It means a lot to me. My kids attend this church. I was baptized in this church and also married in this church. So yeah, this church means a great deal to me. Um, one of the things that we have to understand too is that unlike our white counterparts, if you will, there was a time that the blacks didn't have a church, so that when they went to a Baptist church, they were kicked out or put in the balconies or asked to sit in the back of the church. Now that they have, we have our own church, we're trying not to do the same. We're, we're praying that the church would rise up um, and make a difference and be able to reclaim what, what, what's ours. Um, give the people a sense of identity and, and, and hope. The land that we have for burial right now is, is so small. Um, people's great-grandmothers are buried there. They want to just come home, whether they've gone and lived in Toronto, B.C., uh, you know, they want to come home to be buried. Oh, yeah, yeah. Unless I move away, um, yeah, I, I plan to be buried here. I didn't have my mother with me when my husband got married. She wasn't there when I had my first child. All those things. I come to this grave site on a regular basis. I can talk to her. It's just... Um, I gotta stop. <laughs> this grave site means a lot to me. So what we're trying to do this year, 2005, is bridge the gap again between our community and church. The church is built for the community and the community is built for the church. That church has survived all these years, so there's nothing that's, to me, it's gonna upset it. 160 years that church stood, um, that, that's it, you know. If God be before us, who can be against us? Nobody, not a thing. That's what I believe. Yeah.